you know, we've all seen those movies Mm -hmm. where someone's really sick before like electricity (laughs) (laughs) and the, the mom looks like she's going to die, you know, because she's been nursing this kid. So long. that's (laughs) habit training. (laughs) If you feel like you're dying, you might be doing it right. Um, (laughs) Welcome to Scalay Sisters the podcast for the classical homeschooling mama who seeks to learn and grow while she's helping her children learn and grow. Scalay Sisters is a casual conversation about topics that matter to those of us in the trenches of classical homeschooling, who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. I'm your host, Brandi Vensel. You can come study Charlotte Mason with me over in the Charlotte Mason Think Tank. Go to afterthoughtsblog.net slash think tank to learn more. My co-hosts today are Misty Winkler and Abby Wall. Misty is a homeschooling mom of five, including one graduate. She writes and podcasts at simplyconvivial.com and is the author of The Convivial Homeschool, Gospel Encouragement for Keeping Your Sanity While Living and Learning Alongside Your Kids, now available on Amazon. Abby is basically the queen of the school sistership. Abby is a country living farmer, rancher, a loving wife, and mom of five who homeschools and reads whenever she can. Are you interested in hosting one of our annual online local retreats? We are so excited about this year's plan. Misty has gone above and beyond to make hosting dreamy for you. The real, yes, delivered in your mail hostess kits have exclusive swag for you and your guests, plus all the papers and supplies to make it fun and simple. It's the perfect thing for the homeschool mom group, even if not all your members are classical or Charlotte Mason. This year at the retreat, we'll be talking all things habits and habit training. So to register to be a hostess or just to attend, head over to scolaysisters.com slash habit and sign up. In today's episode, Misty, Abby, and I discuss the new retreat format and why we love it, what's different compared to last year, and also take a deep dive into this year's theme, habits, by discussing what Aristotle had to say about habit in Nicomachean Ethics. I hope you're ready to geek out about habits with us because that's what today is all about. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. I'm here with Misty and Abby, and we're going to be talking about the retreat, including the new format, because now that we've done it once, we know what it's actually like and not, <laughs> not our it imagination. Worked. <laughs> it did work. Um, so I think we'll start off by asking you guys what you liked best about the new format. Well, this is Abby, and my favorite part of the new format, I really love interacting with people. My personality type is an INFJ. And so I really love talking to people in depth about interesting things. And I really love talking with people face to face or in the same room. Podcasting is fun, but I definitely love to see people and their faces. One of the funny things about last year's retreat is people had to go away from the room when we were recording because I wouldn't look at the camera. I would only look at other people's faces. (laughs) And so they kept telling me, look at the camera. So um, (laughs) I just, I feel like I'm pretty relational and I just love being with my friends and talking about interesting things. And I love the research leading up to it. And then being able to kind of discuss those meteor ideas and Though many of you may uh, despise some of the giggling, the laughter is genuine and real. And we have so much fun um, when we're together. Yeah, that's true. We do. So this is Misty. And I agree. I think that the interaction that the new format allowed for made the format relational where you can connect to the ideas a bit more. I know one of the problems I have had in years past speaking to the camera with a prepared talk, 45 minute talk is that I talk too fast. Mm. (laughs) And I like tend to just, you know, when I'm writing a talk, I have a tendency to just want to have every sentence be, you know, I'm writing 
not really thinking about talking and the way that we take in information when we're when we're listening and watching is different from when we're reading. Hmm. And so the the new format where we have not just talking heads, we you know one person giving a prepared talk for 45 minutes, but instead the 45 minute session is several sessions of some prepared remarks and then some conversation about it that just allowed for processing time for listeners. And it forced us to connect it to applications sooner. At least it made me focus on what was actually most important to say and say that more clearly without feeling like I had to expand into the depths. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it just made it a lot more approachable, I think. And we had a lot more fun. It was a lot of fun to reinvent the online retreat model. And I think that it worked. So I'm excited to iterate again and improve it even more. Yeah, absolutely. This is Brandy. And one of my favorite things about the retreat Besides when I forgot my joke about memory, <laughs> um, is, <laughs> which I'm sure I will never live down is I, th- I just feel like this coheres so much better with our purpose for the retreat. The purpose for the retreat has always been trying to build up and support local groups, giving people an opportunity to maybe meet people they don't know in a way that helps them have a common interest as far as educational philosophy, homeschooling, that kind of thing. You know, we really envisioned this as a way to support existing groups or help people start groups that they wish they had. And it just kind of gives them a reason. So to my mind, there's nothing wrong with lecture style. We did it for years and it was Mm -hmm. fine, but the feedback we always got was something along the lines of, I wish we had more time to talk. Mm-hmm. I, I was always like a discussion based sort of wish there. And it seems to me like the more conversational style that this retreat now has, it's just, you know, when you're overhearing a good discussion, it's like, you want to be a part of it it's mm-hmm. supposed to be all the time. Like I start hearing something and I'm like, oh, I wish I could go over there. <laughs> you know, I can't because I have to do what I'm supposed to be doing. It helps pick up the discussion, get the discussion going faster. The time is limited. Even if we talk less and give more time for discussion, there's still a limited time for the whole day. Mm -hmm. Helping them jump right into the discussion, I think can be huge and powerful because it gets them to the place they want to be as far as like a really meaningful conversation. I think this is huge in launching them into that. They're just continuing a discussion that already started and now it's their turn to talk. Mm -hmm. I just think that works really well, especially for groups that don't know each other very well. Yeah. The awkward discussion thing is it's such a hard thing to break through, but you have every group has to break through that before they get to just naturally conversing without help. Mm -hmm. Well, and we had built in time for contemplation together, your own thoughts before, you know, in interspersed with that, because there is a lot of information and discussion is good, but sometimes we even need to process internally a little bit or on paper. True. That's one thing that really helps me retain and assimilate information is just having a moment to think about the most important things that I want to take away from what I just heard or learned. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. I love it. And I also love that it just doesn't feel like the same old thing, like another retreat. That's the same thing with 45 minute talks followed by 15 minute Q and a or whatever. It's just super different. And yet we got no negative feedback. <laughs> so <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> it felt really risky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the format reinforced the real mission that we have for the retreat, which yes. is bringing local groups together to have their own conversations. And so one of the things that we have focused on last year, and then again, this year is making the discussion approachable and relatable to a wider band of people. Because most of us, you know, our local group is a mixture of types of people and not everyone has the same interest in really digging into philosophy or whatever, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to talk about ideas or get 
some encouragement in choosing the right path. And so as we prepare for this new homeschool essentials series of retreats, we are intentionally making the presentations applicable to a wider band of people that would just be a typical local group Mm -hmm. so that those connections can be formed. Right. I think that makes a person more confident putting something out on Facebook and just inviting whoever's in their local homeschool community or whatever, because we're not trying to dig into some sort of niche thing that only three people are interested in in your local community. Right. Okay. At this point, we should probably talk about the one thing that's different compared to last year. I mean, besides the topic, but yes. So you will notice that we are three, a band of three on this episode. (laughs) We have uh, myself, Misty and Abby and Brandy, and we have no Pam Barnhill with us today because get the Kleenex box (laughs) (laughs) because Pam will not be joining us at the retreat this year. And we are going to miss each other. And I blame Delta Airlines for this. (laughs) (laughs) Pam's a little traumatized from earlier travels this year. (laughs) I'm so mad at them because we were going to get one more retreat out of her before that happened. (laughs) Yes. So Pam had already decided that it was time for her to bow out of School A Sisters, the podcast, the retreats and everything as she needs to put more focus on her family right now. She has only just a few more years with teens at home and she wanted to decrease her travel and decrease her time online. So, so she's stepping away. Yes. And we are all still friends and we right. wish Pam the best and she vice versa. She wishes us the best. We, um, we, we are all getting along still. This is <laughs> no one's bad at one another. It's just, yeah, a, this is no, this is a drama decision. free. Yep. <laughs> this is drama free. Well, except for Brandy might've yes, turned her a mean, little bit. I mean, a little sadness, but, <laughs> but essentially there is no animosity or anything. Like <laughs> well, my tantrum was just trying to convince her that she didn't really want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the best way to convince anyone. (laughs) It was ineffective, but I felt better. It was kind of therapeutic. (laughs) Oh, and I just wanted her to know how much I love her. Anyway, so yes, that is the one sad thing about this year. And not just for the retreat, because it's our retreat too. So she's not going to be there for the rest of the things, which is also sad. But anyway. With that said, what is the theme of the retreat this year? Drum roll, please. Habits. Yes. Our theme is habits. And therefore, we thought we would kick off our theme with something that is a little bit more niche because you guys are our listeners, so you can be niche with us. (laughs) It's a discussion of a tiny portion of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, the part where he relates virtue and habit. This is just like the classic beginning of thinking about habit relating to education. We didn't want to ignore it or forget about it or have it get lost in like the practical or anything. So we decided we would talk about it today. I thought we could start with a narration of Aristotle's basic points from the reading. Does anybody want to walk us through a few of what you think are like the most important things that originate with him? Actually, can I start? <laughs> yeah, I would please do. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm, yeah. I, I just because I I mean I've read this a number of times over the years, but I for some reason I was really struck with his discussion of things that come by nature versus things that are more neutral and about how habit cannot adjust the things that are inherent to nature. Mm-hmm. And I think one reason it stuck out to me is because I've been reading a lot of Sherlock Mason's habit training stuff lately. And, you know, she says things like habit is 10 natures, but she's not talking about nature the same way that Aristotle talks about nature, because he's talking about things that are basically immutable. So he's talking about things like gravity. He says, you know, a stone by nature moves downwards and habituation can never make it move upwards, right? Like you could throw it in Mm -hmm. the air a thousand times. And you're never going to change the law of gravity. So that's the kind of thing, you know, when she's talking about a habit being, when Charlotte Mason is talking about a habit being 10 natures, she's talking about 
your human nature. So you're born with a certain personality that has certain proclivities, but you could overcome those things by habit. But human nature is not fixed. Like your character is not fixed the way law of gravity is. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so interesting because then he goes on and he says, you know, because the virtues are not according to nature, he basically describes them as neutral. That's why I put in our notes, natural versus neutral. Because he says like the virtues are not by nature nor are they against nature. Rather, by nature, we're able to acquire them and we can reach perfection through habit, which I've been wondering, by the way, like he says, perfection. So mine is a different translation. Well, and so what does yours say? Because I was thinking about how in the Bible, it talks about perfect, but the word can also be translated mature. So mine says, neither by nature then nor contrary to nature do the virtues arise in us. Rather, we are adapted by nature to receive them and are made perfect by habit. Hmm. I, I'm curious. I wonder what the Greek word is in there. Right. If it's, and I don't if know it's like a rete, you know, where it's excellence. Right. I don't know. Well, and in my translation, I mean, I'm sure in yours too, that the first paragraph talks about while moral virtue comes about as a result of habit, whence also its name, and it was Ithaca is one that is formed by slight variation from the word ethos habit. I don't know. That was in the first part. Yeah. And he talks about the connection to ethics, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. Yeah. Hold on. I'm looking up. Where was the part on perfection? Um, That was in. It's one. And then it's like the very bottom of the first paragraph in two, one. Yeah. Sub point one where it says what is natural cannot be changed by habituation. It's the, that perfection is the last sentence of that point Mm -hmm. in book two in book two. Yeah. Yeah. Book two, section one. Oh, I'm in section two. Does it say what the word is? Well, I was actually looking up some of the new Testament verses. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking about like for, okay. So here's a good example. Philippians three 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. You know, like there's places where Christians are referred to as being made perfect or um, becoming perfect or whatever. And I'm, I think I'm noticing that there's actually a number of different words used there. I used to think it was just one word. I don't know why I thought that. So for example, that particular verse, it uses, let's see, a Greek word teleos. Okay. And that one, which is interesting because we talk about the telos, I'm sure mm-hmm. that those things are related, but it's saying like brought, brought to its end, finished, wanting nothing necessary to completeness. And then you get down to the end. It says of men, adult, mature, full age. And that's what mm-hmm. I was wondering when I read that, if that he's talking about, this is how you're brought to maturity, right? So the perfect man, they mean perfection in the sense of completeness because it even says here consummate human integrity and virtue. Mm. So this is just from Strong's concordance. It's nothing fancy, but um, I was going to say sometimes at the bottom, he'll, it, it'll say something about like, Oh, also used in Aristotle or something. Oh, it does say that Plato uses the word that way. So if Plato does, my guess would be that also Aristotle does. This is Aeschylus, Aeschylus, Aeschylus. I don't know how to say his name, Polybius, Xenophon, I mean, they all use it that way. So, okay. So I think I'm probably. So it's like that noble nobility. Yeah. That's the aim of education. Right. Yeah. So I did look up in the great tradition, um, Aristotle's section, just because I thought maybe there would be something also in habits, but, um, and it goes from the Nicomachean ethics book 10, which I know we weren't doing, but he does have a couple things. And I think that's, it illustrates this this point we were just talking about. So one of the, one of the sections here, it talks about connecting virtue to habit. And that's, that's the main, I think that was one of the main themes of this section, kind of the ordo amoris, right? Loving what is noble and hating what is base is, is one of the things he says in book 10. And then Mm -hmm. it goes on to say, but doubtless it is not enough for people to receive the right nurture and discipline in youth. They must also practice the lessons they have learned and confirm them by habit when they are grown up. Mm. So it does have that being made into someone who has these habits and is, you know, the perfected. And and he talks a lot about the different 
extremes and then the mean, the in-between. And that takes a long time to learn and, and perpetuate. So it would be interesting to just put that sentence right after the one in book two, that's often quoted about habits. So it makes no small difference, whether people are habituated in one way or in another way, straight from childhood. On the contrary, it makes a huge one or rather all the difference. Something about what you read, Abby, reminds me of how scripture teaches us that to whom much is given much is expected. I was thinking about just this idea of like, it has to be confirmed in adulthood. We can give our children all of these things, but at some point they have to, it, they have to confirm it themselves. Yes. Like the habit mm-hmm. training itself is not the sole power. It is a power in their life if we do it correctly, but it's not like determinative. Yes. Is that a word? I feel like maybe I made I that think so. Up. Yeah, okay. Sounds oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I doubted myself after it came out of my mouth, <laughs> but that actually kind of reminds me of that section where he talks about, um, I think it's near the end, right. Where he talks about that. The habit is also a decision. Yeah. It's near the end of the section. Cause we only assigned like the first four. So we looked at book two and the first four main sections of book two, but at the end, where is it? Let me see. So this is the crafts versus virtue set for actions, expressing virtue to be done temperately or justly and hence, well, it does not suffice that they are themselves in the right state. Rather, the agent must also be in the right state when he does them first. This is the important part. He must know that he is doing virtuous actions. Second, he must decide on them and decide on them for themselves. I think with behaviorism in our culture, a lot of teaching on habit training is trying to circumvent decision by like programming your kids like they're a computer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's another place where I think Aristotle and Charlotte Mason agree that that's not (laughs) what's supposed to be going on. And the virtuous person has to be making, it's a habit, but they have to be making a choice. In fact, I, I don't know. I wondered is the habit actually the making of the same decision over and over again, at least to Aristotle? I don't think that's the case with Charlotte Mason, but I was wondering about with him, if that's really what he's getting at. Well, Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's very simple in it. A, Mm -hmm. a just person acts justly and a courageous (laughs) person, (laughs) person acts with courage, right? These are the things like he just, so he just says, and it's, and that's the one thing too. It isn't, um, you talked about that too. It's just, you can't just be talking about theories and philosophies, but it's the actions that you are doing and, and over and over. Mm -hmm. But I think the training of does get into behavioralism. Um, it's easy to fall into. Right. Right. Well, and a lot of the modern books on habit really, it can maybe try to walk that line or fall into behavioralism because they all seem to emphasize the automatic nature of habit, like that you're making these choices without decision-making. So to do habit training, you have, you have to consciously choose, but the goal is to get to the point of not having to decide anymore. Um, I guess my question is, are we just so sunk in behaviorism that we're okay with that <laughs> because there is a part of me that's like, yeah, I want to get to the point where it's not a decision, <laughs> like, but, but the difference is too, is like behaviorism is specifically conditioning. Right. And I think of right. things like Pat, you know, Pavlov's dog or this kind of animal behaviorism where, you know, you give them a treat, like these different things. Whereas when Aristotle connects it to virtue, it's about loving what is good and noble Mm -hmm. and hating what is base, not just, I mean, he does talk about how punishment and pleasure do play a part of that, but he understands that, you know, those decisions, those choices, and it becoming an actual virtue is not because it's just conditional. It's because it's been internalized and then confirmed. Mm -hmm. It's where the Ordo Amoris comes in, where you're using the habit training is helping everyone in your family, including yourself to love what ought to be loved and to hate what ought to be hated because we don't 
naturally and instinctively love and therefore choose what we ought. And so there's an Mm -hmm. acknowledgement of that. And I think that that's what's missing in the modern habit stuff, an understanding of human nature being fallen and sinful. And the pagans knew that man was not naturally good. (laughs) Right. Like that's a modern, you know, that's Rousseau. If you start with Rousseau, then you can program, you, you think you can program other people or even yourself because you think you're a blank slate. Mm-hmm. And uh, even Aristotle, Plato, they were better observers of actual human nature and what was going on. And then you have Augustine and Lewis quote that idea. Also, they, they draw on that idea of Ordo Amoris that we do not naturally love and choose what we ought to choose, but it is objectively discoverable (laughs) what we ought to love and choose. Right. And so it takes intention. I have another quote later in Nicomachean ethics underlined where he just says, that is why it takes work to be excellent. (laughs) Yes. And sometimes what we want when we're thinking about habit training is like, just tell me, how can I make this easier? Yeah. Right. And yes. you know, Charlotte Mason makes us think that so she has the secret <laughs> with her, her smooth and easy days. <laughs> right. But this is the thing is that with a focus on that, what we're really saying is I want the outcome without the work because she yeah. talks in other places about like, well, you have to deal with like when the, when a child is in a in a dire situation where they've gotten this really terrible habit, right? Yeah. Like they're now under the burden of their besetting sins. She talks about treating that like measles. And if you know how the measles had to be treated in the Victorian age, I mean, you're <laughs> talking about weeks of sacrifice where that's all the parent gets to do is try to keep that child from going blind. Right. And <laughs> all of the nursing and all of the late nights, early mornings, no sleep, all that, like there's a huge amount of self-sacrifice that goes into having to treat a seriously ill child all by yourself. (laughs) Right. I mean, yes, they would call the doctor, but you know, we've all seen those movies where Uh someone's really sick, you know, before like electricity (laughs) (laughs) and the, the mom looks like she's going to die, you know, because she's been nursing this kid. So long. that's habit (laughs) training. (laughs) If you feel like you're dying, you might be doing it right. Um, (laughs) Well, (laughs) And Aristotle talks about how work is good, right? Yeah. You know, like it's, it's a good thing. And yes, you're probably going to get some complaining and pushback and, and the things that are, you know, that come easy to us aren't appreciated, but hard work actually makes us appreciate it. So that's true. I think that's a really good point actually, because there can be this sense of if this is really hard, I'm doing something wrong. Right. But the point where the smooth and easy days thing. And I, I mean, I know that that is like, especially to our modern minds, it's probably just a dangerous thing to say, like that shouldn't be the selling point, but, (laughs) but there is a sense in which that is what can come. But after all of the hard work and, you know, the keeping watch over everything still takes a lot for a mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just easier to have kids with good habits than it is to have kids with bad habits. <laughs> kids with bad habits are intolerable. <laughs> so. And it does, I think, you know, we've all heard some of the things like it takes, I forget what they say now, but I've heard 30, I've heard 60, I've heard a hundred days to make a habit. And so we think that we're in this like sprint of like, if we, it'll just take us that long. But I think what Aristotle is emphasizing here is that a habit is a lifelong thing. Yes. And it's a lifelong set of decisions that do become easier over time. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about virtue, there is still going to be always a sense of having to choose. It might be an easier Mm -hmm. decision to make and you'll be working. You'll have internal tendencies and a sense of normal, 
that helps you choose the right thing, but you still have to choose to do the right thing because right. we have, we always have that inner pull towards the wrong thing. Right. It's funny. Cause even with basic morally neutral mechanical habits, like I was thinking about how the way that I do the podcast from beginning to end is a habit or it's a collection of habits. Like I do all these different things in this order. And mm-hmm. yet we take a month off and I have to print my process sheet where I've detailed everything I need to do, or I will forget something. Right. To me, this is the weird part because it's not like, oh, I made this decision to do a bad job on the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, But it's like, I think that there is this aspect that we forget that is just human frailty, that we are a forgetful people. Yeah. And so I didn't do the habit badly. I just didn't do it. And I didn't do it because I didn't need to do it. But by the time it was time to do it again, I was slow. I had to refer to my list. It's amazing to me how quickly we can fall apart. And I don't think that that speaks against habit as much as it speaks for this idea of watching, reinforcing, right? Mm -hmm. We even have to do that with ourselves. Like there's a reason why I typed up a list and made one. Mm -hmm. I felt like you were getting tired of voxing me and saying like, well, where is X, Y, Z? And I'm like, oh yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I don't know where it is. (laughs) I should go find it. Well, and that, that makes sense too. And I'm going to bring in exercise because that's what I do. on every episode. Um, <laughs> Please do. But if you stop exercising and you have, you know, say you, you, you are running every day or, you know, on a running, running program, and then you stop running, it only takes a few weeks before and elite runners will say even a few days off will, you know, counteract those things. But muscles and soreness and all these things. And it's a lot harder to make yourself go and exercise again, because, you know, you do lose some of that, you know, cardiovascular or muscular things. And it is, it is a thing. One thing about weight training is nice is because it's, it's a slower build. You also lose it slow, more slowly. And Mm -hmm. so that is one, but if you take months off the gym, you have to start way lower in rate, you know, rates and, and weights and everything. So it is, it is one of those things that if you keep it up, you can progress slowly, but if you take time off, it is definitely, you're dealing with the decision to go and do it. And you're, you're battling against your own physical. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I can't find the quote I'm looking for. The whole like pleasure and pain thing. Mm -hmm. I just thought this was interesting. Maybe I don't have a real question. Is it it in number three? It's in three. three. Yeah. I just, I thought I underlined it, but this is actually size book. And so I try not to underline too much (laughs) (laughs) and he has all his underlines. So then I get distracted. (laughs) Yeah. He talks about it taking punishment. Right. I don't know. It was interesting. It was like, if you are, well, okay. I'm going to take an example of anorexia. So if you are abstaining from food and let's say it's appropriate, you should be abstaining from food, but you're abstaining from food because you get a kick out of it, which is like typical anorexia, then there's still something wrong in order to build virtue. The state of the heart has to, has to also be right. Yeah. The motive. Right. And so anyway, so I was thinking about that, like what happens do you think? with behaviorism, if kids are being programmed like little machines and it, the heart is just completely ignored, like, I don't know. Is there a long-term consequence of that? Of course there is. I mean, yeah. I'm trying, I guess I was <laughs> trying to imagine. Is, I'm not sure. I that's what I was trying to imagine. <laughs> like, I was trying to imagine like, is, or is it just that actually the habit is being an automaton where you don't make any real dis- decisions? Maybe that's the habit. The habit is just being Uh, available to be programmed by someone who is in authority over you? Well, it's, if habits is training your emotions and your affections, then what behaviorism does is trains you only in those physical bodily habits. So the only environmental stimulus or whatever, right. The only (laughs) kinds of rewards that appeal to you are the material stickers, the treat, the sugar, (laughs) you know, or, or just applause, 
those kinds of external rewards that in and of themselves aren't wrong or bad, but they aren't sufficient for virtue, for forming virtue, because the end goal of virtue is that you actually enjoy doing good. So that's that whole virtue Mm -hmm. is its own reward thing (laughs) Mm -hmm. that you get through habitually doing it because it takes practice to get to the point of recognizing that it is a good in itself. But the end goal, even if you do use some other external pleasures to help push toward the ultimate pleasure, the end goal is recognizing that virtue is good and rewarding in itself. Mm -hmm. Whereas behavioralism doesn't think that anything is good in itself. You just have to get a quick dopamine hit. And that's the only kind of motivation available for people. So what you're then basically trained to be a pleasure seeker. Yeah. Interesting. That applies to so much then, doesn't it? (laughs) Goodness. And yet he even says here, it is harder to fight pleasure than to fight emotion. Hmm. So I was thinking about how hard it is for any of us, well-trained or not, to fight pleasure. Like that's the, probably the root of temptation. <laughs> and so then it was pleasing to the eye, right? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> totally. So then if we're allowing our children to be habit trained by pleasure and pain, we're actually setting them up to just be slaves to their passions. Mm. I think that becomes just really interesting because it's like, yes, we want good habits. Yes. We want habit training. How we do our habit training becomes huge. If what we're going for, I mean, what does Aristotle say over and over? Our goal is not just to know about virtue. Our goal is to become good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like if that is our goal, if we're actually trying to help our children be who in many ways, I think a lot of them would like to be like, you know, I mean, like they read in books and they admire heroes and they admire good people. They would, there's an, an attraction there. They would like to be that, but we have to be careful how we do it, or we're not actually helping them grasp goodness. Mm-hmm. They're just looking good at some point. So in uh, the great tradition, there was one other quote that I did want to talk about because I thought this was interesting. Okay. So Paternal exhortations and family habits have authority in the household, just as legal enactments and national customs have authority in the state. Mm. And the more so on the account of the ties of relationships and of benefits conferred that unite the head of the household to its other members. He can count on their natural affection and obedience at the outset. I just, I thought that was an interesting thought because it sounds to me like he's just saying that we're already predisposed to have family ties and relationships and habit training as part of our family culture, which I know that that's what you Brandy have been saying. Right. Um, yeah. And that's our, our quote, right. For our, mm-hmm. I've never been on a bookmark before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I, cause I teach, a section on habit in Charlotte Mason boot camp, you know, so up until recently, I've done that three times a year. And I kept feeling like we have to have a way of boiling this down where it's really simple. And I don't know, I just feel like there's a lot of misconceptions about habit training. So anyway, eventually I started saying something along the lines of habit is a thing, but habit training, using habit training as a tool of education, that is using repeat actions to define what is normal for your family. So family culture is basically a habit. Mm -hmm. That was a powerful thought for me. It was very empowering, right? If I look at my family and I'm not happy with how it is. So a subculture of our family culture is our homeschool culture, right? I can try to use habit as a lever to lift us out of some of the things that are so distasteful (laughs) and make our days difficult. And it's not the whole promise of smooth and easy days, but it's like, there are some basic bad habits that I was able to then root out. And it was a relief to me, (laughs) Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes. So, you know, I kind of wonder too about, you know, we get frustrated with our kids 
with their affections. Sometimes we're wrong to be frustrated. I think with their affections, they're an individual, they're not us. So sometimes the source of, of the discontentment is actually a problem with mom. Like I've experienced that, but other times it's like, I'm wanting to rush the relationship. Mm. I'm already in the relationship. So I'm, it's like you bring your boyfriend home. You want everybody to immediately love them, but they just met him. Right. Mm-hmm. Like they, they, so they're still waiting to be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that you're impressed does not impress them. Right. So, but I'm just thinking like, this is my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you just think like, okay, well, some of that is a habit. They need to get to know him for, and so when I think of like subjects, I wish they like activities. I wish they like, I can't make them like it, but I can just build those things as habits into our life. And they, it might grow on them Mm -hmm. if I give them some time and lay off the pressure and just see what happens. And, and they might not let you know that they actually liked it until they've been gone for about 10 years. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Cause they wouldn't want you to be satisfied with yourself. Um. (laughs) I do. I, I think that it's so easy to be impatient and not even realize that it's impatience Mm, that's that's tripping us up in, in parenting in general. And I have to say homeschooling is just intense parenting. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. So true. Let me put that one on a bookmark. Yeah. (laughs) I was waiting for you to say I did. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't. (laughs) It's good to have goals. (laughs) Well, is there anything else you want to say about Aristotle before we wrap this up? Uh, it's a section that bears rereading set yes. all the time. Yes, that is very it. true. Yep. But we won't talk about Aristotle our whole retreat. Right. That's, not, that's a good transition. We, will not, have, we will not have a scary retreat, <laughs> an intimidating <laughs> retreat. <laughs> this is for the people who wanted to geek out before the retreat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, um, my final question that I put in our notes was, you know, like, why would we spend a whole retreat on this? But I think after this conversation, it's kind of obvious because <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot that goes into it. And we have to try to, we have to try to set up a, v- a vision of habits that is not part of behaviorism. Mm-hmm. And yet we also have to talk about practical parts of actual habit training. Like, how do you actually do something like this? Mm -hmm. So that could definitely take more than a day, but we're going to spend a day. (laughs) (laughs) We're calling this retreat homeschool essentials, because these are the things that a homeschool really can't do without. Mm -hmm. Yes. I kind of come back to what Aristotle was saying is that we don't want to study about virtue. We want to be good. So the point of the retreat is not to study about habits it's actually the practical part, right? Like the philosophy is only as good as we can work it out in practice. So Mm -hmm. yes, we're going to talk about a philosophy of habits because we have to break our modern mindset about habits because everything comes from the behaviorist tradition Yes, Mm -hmm. in our world. But if we just stop there, it's like, that's interesting. (laughs) (laughs) So we do want to get into the actual practical So these are examples of how we can actually do this, how we can live this out, how we can have a train. Yeah. What kinds of habits we should be building in ourselves and in our kids. And then how do we go about actually doing that? And even how do we go about staying encouraged and on track when it takes way longer (laughs) than we want it to take? Right. Yes. (laughs) The encouragement to keep on keeping on is I think what, we all need as homeschool moms, most of all. Amen. That is true. Well, that was a good final thought. So with that said, I'll just Woo-hoo. thank you both for coming. This was fun. Yes. Yes. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone in person for the retreat. In person. Be so great. Too. All right. Have a great rest of your day, ladies. That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the sisterhood of the podcast. Make sure you're following us and your favorite podcast player so you don't miss any of our episodes. All of the books and things we mentioned today are linked in our show notes. 
Just go to scolesisters.com slash SS109 to check it out. Don't forget to register for the annual retreat. Early bird pricing ends August 19th, so don't delay. Last year, we ran out of physical hostess kits, so if you want one, make sure you jump on that ASAP. Just go to scolesisters.com slash habit to register. This is the end of our always brief summer podcast season, but don't be sad. The fall season starts in a little less than a month. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you needn't run alone. So open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. We are talking about the retreat today. I'm here with. Abby Wall. You sound, you sound <laughs> like a voice voicemail what? message. <laughs> that, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm having an interruption. Just one second. Come in quickly. What do you need? You Raise your hand if you're surprised. Yes. Abby has an interruption. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be out in a little bit when my door opens and you can come in. Okay. Thanks. Do you know what time it is? It is um, 10:30. The coffee maker has a clock. Can you say? Okay, I'm changing I am not it. A clock. <laughs> I'm changing our saying. It's not a podcast until someone buys a book and Abby's kids come in the room. <laughs> How about it? How about it? I know. I know. I love it. It's, just, it's very heartwarming, actually. <laughs> it's real life. Habit. Tra- we apparently we need to work on habit training and not interrupting mommy. <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> um, but Abby, they need to know what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh.